Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome back, everybody who are present over here, and uh, those who are joining live from Tibet House Facebook and YouTube. And uh, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Tenzin Doma, Program Coordinator of Tibet House New Delhi, and I'll be moderating today's second session, which is on attention and mind perspectives from cognitive science and Buddhist psychology. And now I would like to welcome our uh, respected chairperson for the session, Dr. Parisha Jijina Ji, Assistant Professor of Psychology, Maharaja Sayajira University, Baroda, and the esteemed speakers, Dr. Narayan Shirinivasanan uh, Shiri Ji, Head of the Department of Cognitive Science, IIT Kanpur, Venerable Geshema Tinsen Hadinla, Additional Secretary to the Board of Geshema Degree Examination Committee, Department of Religion and Culture, Tibetan, uh, Central Tibetan Administration, Dharamsala. And lastly, Dr. Puja Dabralji, uh, Assistant Professor at Department of Buddhist and Tibetan Studies, Namgil Institute of Tib uh, Tibetology, affiliated with Sikkim, Sikkim University, last but not the least, uh, Ms. Tenzin Putila, Counselor at uh, Dalai Lama Institute of Higher Education, Bangalore, to kindly take their respected seats on the dais, please. And please welcome our chairperson and the speakers. Um, before I proceed, I would like to request to the participant that um, we will have a Q&A period at the end of this session. Therefore, please do not ask questions during the talk while speakers are presenting. It interrupts the flow of the speakers. And secondly, the participants can raise one question at the time so that everybody gets the same equal opportunity. Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce our chairperson, Dr. Parisha Jijina Ji. She has completed her master's in psychology from the University of Pune and MPhil in clinical psychology from University of Delhi and PhD in Maharaja Sayajirao University of Baroda. And she is working as a assistant professor of psychology in the MS University of Baroda since the last 10 years. And she's also currently as the assistant director of the postgraduate diploma in clinical and applied hypnosis. And her interest lies in exploring indigenous construct which can contribute to the Indian ethos of well-being and be useful in psychotherapeutic application in Indian context. Now I would like to request Dr. Parisha to kindly proceed the session, please. Thank you. I would like to thank Tibet House and Geshila for this opportunity. Uh, this panel is an extremely interesting one because it is based on attention. So attention plays one of the most critical and important role in almost every area of our life, whether it is school, work, even our relationships. With the right attention, we can connect more fully and directly with whatever life brings to us. However, many times our attention and perception is distorted because of our biases, our habits, fears and desires. With increasing use of social media, where we mindlessly scroll and distractedness is at its peak, we have glorification of multitasking, our attention is being compromised. So the theme of today's panel is extremely relevant, attention and mind, perspectives from cognitive science and Buddhist psychology. We have four very experienced speakers. So I would like to first introduce our first speaker for today, Professor Narayanan Srinivasan. Uh, uh, Professor Srinivasan is currently professor and head at the Department of Cognitive Science, IIT Kanpur. He has obtained his undergraduate degree in physics at the University of Madras, his master's degree in electrical engineering from the very reputed uh, Indian Institute of Science, and his doctoral degree in psychology from University of Georgia in the United States. He has worked at Allahabad University as a professor for 17 years. 
and he studies mental processes uh, that is co uh, consciousness attention decision making using multiple methodologies dr shrinivasan is a fellow of the very reputed naop that is national academy of psychology and he is also currently the president of association for cognitive science so i welcome you to the dais sir Okay, thank you. Um, first, let me thank Tibetaos and Geshela for the invitation and giving me an opportunity to share some of our work with all of you. Um, so feel free to ask questions later or whenever. Uh, we will see how it goes. Let me check. Okay. Oh, okay, let me, I can pause this. Doesn't matter. Okay, so we're going to talk about attention, uh, something we study in cognitive science and something that's important in Buddhist psychology as well. Um, the first obvious thing I want to point out both in cognitive science as well as in Buddhist psychology is that there are many concepts or words that is associated with attention. There is actually no one single word or one single concept, uh, both in cognitive science as well as Buddhist psychology. So this is just an example. It's not an exhaustive list. So if you are a cognitive scientist or a cognitive psychologist, you will study things like selective attention, which is further subdivided into endogenous versus exogenous uh, selection. You will see words like executive control or cognitive control you will see words like sustained attention, okay? So there are many words or processes that denote attention. So simply saying attention is not sufficient, okay? You need to specify exactly what uh, you're talking about. And they have different mechanisms, the way they affect other mental processes are different and so on. Similarly, um, same is true for Buddhist psychology as well. Um, I do not know any of the original Pali or Sanskrit or Tibetan. Uh, most of it, I'm just picked up this from this book, Attention Not Self by Jonathan Ganeri. Um, the book focuses on predominantly on attention and uh, talks a lot about Buddha Gosha, but that's different. But anyway, so I'm going to just, I put three terms here, Sati, mindful attention. That's the way he translates it. Ekagata, attentional placing is, is wording. Manasikara, attentional focusing. Okay. And of course, attention, uh, these concepts are concomitants of awareness and consciousness as well. So what I'm going to do is mainly talk about our work on how attention affects conscious experience. And even within this, I'm going to focus on only two things which I study. That is how our visual experience, which right now all of you are seeing me or seeing the scene in front of you and experiencing, you know, visually something. The other thing that I study is time. How do you experience time, passage of time and so on. Okay. So these are the only two things I'm going to focus on. Now. In the context of uh, psychology, scientific psychology in 19th century, people started asking questions about does attention actually influence the way we experience the world? Okay, it may look so obvious, but it's not the case. Uh, the reason is that it's easy to show in behavior that there are changes, that your performance gets better. It's more difficult to show that the way you experience the world itself changes. Um, this is just from three pioneers. Uh, those of you who are familiar with psychology will know these names. 
Wilhelm Wundt, Gustav Fechner, William James. I'm not going to read the quotes, but basically the, I, the only reason I have put it, up, put it up is that there is disagreement that some, somebody is saying that it, it does, somebody is saying actually it doesn't at all, right? Now, there is some sort of a resolution. Now it took a long time to experimentally show it in the laboratory um, by Marisa Carrasco and colleagues at New York University. I'm going to talk about an experiment that we did based on their studies. So, but let's just quickly go through it. Uh, by the way, I'm a cognitive psychologist. I use predominantly here psychophysics, quantitatively trying to measure experience using certain methodologies. Um, so you will see some graphs. Uh, I'm not really going to explain fully the method, but I'll be happy to talk about them. Okay, so just focus on this side. This is a blank screen. You see two dots. In this case, it's on this side. In this case, it's on the other side. Or there could be no dots as well. Okay. So the idea here is that if these dots come on one side, it kind of grabs your attention to that side. And that's the basic notion here. We call it exogenous queuing or exogenous attention sometimes. After a little bit of delay, there will be two faces. And these are faces showing some emotion. And you can see they are slightly you know, tilted in the sense one is a bit above, one is a bit below. And the, for the subject, the task is pretty simple. They are supposed to tell of the two faces, whichever one is either happier or sadder. And whether that particular face appeared either on the left side, right side, a bit above or below, okay? So directly you are not asked to report about the emotional intensity shown by the face, but indirectly we are measuring it, okay? Now what you see here is the proportion of the time they do that. And when you do these tasks, and this is something if you are done psychology, you'll be familiar with, you will get a, what is called a psychometric function. It's a sigmoidal function. Basically it will go like this and go like this, okay? The sigmoidal function is something very common when you measure um, perception. And what you are seeing is three different sigmoidal functions depending on whether you picked where the face, when the dots came on this side, you picked the face on this side or on the other side, or when there were no dots um, at all. And basically there are three curves here. Uh, the only thing way to interpret this is that the red curve which is the leftmost side, is basically for the face that appears where on the same side that the dots appear, okay? So you can think of it as the side in which the dots came and you paid more attention to, okay? So that's basically the only thing. So what happens is that, as you can see, depending on how you pay attention, this curve shifts, okay? It moves to the left. So from an interpretation perspective, basically, the same face here, so if you see on the x-axis, you have intensity of emotions, which is shown here, too small probably, but intensity of emotions on the x-axis, proportion of face picked on the y-axis, and then basically for the same face, if it appears when you, basically when you pay attention to it, it looks more happier or more sadder, okay? So the way the particular emotional expression appears to you changes depending on whether you pay attention to the face or not, okay? That's basically. Okay, that's not the only thing. There are other things, ways uh, in which experimentally you can start looking at this. And this is another example. Um, what you see here is the blue square. For those of you who are familiar with it, so there is a phenomenon called after images. That is, if you keep, just stare at, you can do it with any light also here. If you stare at something for a few seconds, say a blue square, then you look at a white wall or a gray wall, then you will see a red square as, I'm oh, sorry, yellow square as an after image, okay? Um, this after image will appear. The more you stare, it will stay there for longer and so on. This after image is something we can 
measure the properties of those after images. One interesting thing, well, there are many interesting things about it. One is there is really nothing on the screen. It is something that you experience, but there is nothing shown on the screen, okay? So if you see this blue square, now what you can do is, right, you can actually make people do some other task. In this case, a bunch of letters were flashed one after other in the middle, and you can change properties of those and see how it affects the perception of the after images themselves, okay? So it's an indirect way of measuring it. So what you can do is you can have a very small letter, we can have a really large letter, or you can have these letter made up of small letters. So you can ask people to focus on the small letter or the larger letter and so on. The idea is that depending on how your attention is manipulated for these letters at the center, your properties of these after image will actually change. So it's indirectly you can measure how the way you manipulate, you pay attention to something changes your experience, in this case, the experience of after images. Okay, which is what is shown here. These are after image durations. That is how long uh, the after images actually kind of come, stay, then kind of go, come back again, and so on. The first time, how long it stays is what is on the y-axis. These are four different conditions, which is to do with how you pay attention to these letters of the middle. And basically all you see is that when the letter is very small here, because you have to focus your attention more, your after image durations are longer. And obviously it's much smaller when the letter is large. So really actually you are not changing anything to do with the blue square here. It's exactly the same in all four conditions. All you are doing is changing what people do with the central letters. And then you see there is a difference in the perception um, in this case, the duration of the after images. With these letters, remember, you can kind of zoom in or zoom in. Sometimes people use the metaphor of spotlight uh, for attention, but you can also think in terms of zoom lens as in camera. So you can kind of zoom in or zoom out. And you can do that, make people zoom in or zoom out using these stimuli, which are, this is just a lot, I don't know, I'm not sure people at the back can see it, it's a large S, but it's made up of small H's actually, or H's and so on. So either you can ask people to focus on the small letter or you can ask people kind of zoom out and focus on the large letter, okay? And when you do that, and these are masks, it's presented for very brief durations. Again, you can get a function like this, but now you can do two things. The first thing people used to do is to measure accuracy, how accurate you are in detecting some target, two letters. But recently, in the last 10, 15 years, we have been using what is called a partial awareness scale. It's a four point scale to see how sharp or how well you see something, okay? Using this four point scale, again, you can construct a psychometric function like this. And then you can, of course, see the red one is for the large letter and the green one is for the small letter. And what is not clear here, which will be clear, I guess, in the next one, is that there are two things you can measure with these functions. One is basically how shifted to the left or right they are, and you can measure the 50% point, and then you can denote that. The second thing you can measure is how steep this function is, okay? The basic idea here is steeper the function, the better your resolution is. So your perceptual resolution is better if it's steeper, okay? So the slope is a measure of resolution, okay? So what you see here is that you can start seeing now that in when it slopes, there is a difference between whether you are focusing on the large letter or the small letter. It changes your slope. Remember, if you think of this as a spatial spotlight and change the size of it, it's not only by changing the size of this, you are also changing the resolution of your visual processing, okay? So changing attention changes your resolution as well. Okay, let me move on, I will skip this. Similarly, 
if you are think for those who know some physics, so if spatially you change the spotlight, remember our vision, our perception is spatio-temporal, right? There is also time as well. So the question is that if your attention kind of expands in space, then the question is what happens in time? Are they related to each other? One possibility is they are not related to each other at all. What we have argued is that actually they are related to each other. So if you expand in space, it shrinks in time, okay? Um, so the idea here is that you, you can actually verify this. How do you do this? Now you have to ask people to attend to the large letter or the small letter. So spatially you change this, but then you have to measure temporal resolution. How do you do that? Well, one way to do it is, if you can see this much observation, show two dots. So one dot comes first, then another dot comes. So the, for the subject, the task is to say which dot appeared first, okay? And you can manipulate the, the time gap between the two dots. Obviously, larger the gap, it's easy to tell, yeah, 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 this came first or this came first. But what happens is when they get closer and closer in time, when it's very close to each other, then you are at chance performance, okay? So once again, and this is ubiquitous if you are doing psychophysics, you get a psychometric function. But as I said, now I can measure resolution for time based on whether you are paying attention to the small letter or the large letter. And then you can see, and this is when the global, the blue is when you are paying attention to the large letter. And what you can see is it's become steeper now. So the temporal resolution gets better when spatial resolution gets poorer, actually. The window becomes larger here, becomes smaller there in time. Okay, so they are related to each other and influence how you perceive. Okay, I'm going to show some more, hopefully there's enough time, um, on effects of meditation as well. Same thing now, remember you, you saw the blue squares and all that, and we did that with typical undergraduate 20-year-old uh, students, but you have also done with meditators and non-meditators and so on. What do you see? Well, if it is the case, the basic idea is if you pay better attention to the task, the blue square, the after image durations actually increase. And if meditators are better at paying attention to whatever you tell them to do, then the duration for the blue square, the after image should increase even further. And that's precisely what you see. Uh, forget about other conditions, uh, I will skip. Basically, the white bars are for meditators and the black bars are for non-meditators. It's huge effect, okay? So the meditators show much longer after image durations. Not only that, if you ask them how clear or how sharp the after image is, remember there is nothing on the screen here, it's only their perception. Uh, then they report it to be much sharper as well. So two things, one, durations are longer, second, the after images are much more sharper or clearer as well. There's more clarity. Um, as I said, there are many attentional processes and how do you measure them? There are various tasks that we use to measure. I just put this as an example because with this one task, you can measure three things. So it's convenient. Uh, so basically this is called an attentional network task. Uh, basically, there is a fixation point. There are either two stars, up one up or below, or one star, or only up or below. And then basically a target, which is basically these arrows, appear either here or here. And you are supposed to report the direction of the central arrow. And the central, these arrows, which we call flankers, can be in the same direction or can be in the different direction. If they are in different direction, they are incongruent. Basically, they make your task harder. And if they are in the same direction, you are faster, okay? So this is in terms of how when there is distracting information, you can respond to something, okay? So that is called ex an executive control or a congruent effect. You can also measure orienting. That is what happens when something comes before and something comes, you can orient to that target or generally your, how alert you are. 
okay, this particular results are, uh, were from, okay, occasionally I have thrown in these words I'm not really going to talk about because just to see whether we can link it to certain terms that are in Buddhist psychology. It's very sketchy. I'm not really claiming anything, but um, you can see. So basically, with this is this was done with students who uh, adolescents who practice transcendental meditation. Um, but basically, you see there is an effect of alerting here. There is no effect on orienting, and there is an effect in terms of conflict monitoring or executive control. Uh, just one more small thing to point out. Uh, this particular task, since it has been used with many types of meditation, you don't get exactly the same effects for all types of meditations. So you get different patterns. Okay. So, okay. Um, another way you can look at visual experience, I know we use all these um, illusions or stimuli in the lab. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, is um, this is the last thing. Okay, so these are, this is called a Necker cube, okay? So if you keep looking at this Necker cube, it will switch its orientation, okay? Nothing changes on the screen. So you can keep staring at it. You can try it even now. It will switch, okay? From one orientation to another orientation. And this is something that happens to everyone. Now, what I can also ask you to do is, I can ask you to hold on to a particular whatever you are seeing for as long as possible, okay? This much control is actually possible. People can actually control this to some extent. Obviously, I can ask, or I can ask you to switch it, change it as fast as possible, okay? There is only a range in which you can go, but you can, there is still under voluntary control, okay? Even though this is an illusion. So I can ask you to either hold or speed uh, or change it fast. Here there is very small difference, let's ignore this. But normally what do you see? This is with non-meditators is blue, uh, red is with meditators. And as you can clearly see, the durations are much longer, even just normally for meditators. But the more important thing is what happens when you actually ask people to hold on to it as much as possible. The meditators, the duration increases much more for the meditators. They are able to hold on. And this is endogenous control. You do it by instructions. You tell people, this is what you do, right? And you can see it, you can plot it, but basically the idea is that meditators show much better control over what they see compared to non-meditators, right? You can also do it with flankers, these things on the side. The central one is the Necker cube. Now these things kind of bias you towards seeing it one way or the other. And I, we can measure how the surrounding flankers, the distractors affect how you see the central one, okay? Like the arrows before. And you, let's first look at non-meditators. You can see clearly that uh, there is an effect that when they were same, the durations were longer, that's green. And when they were different from each other, the, then, you know, you get red. What happens with meditators? This, these were actually with Sahaj Samadhi meditators, but there is really no difference at all. So the fact that even these things are on the side, it doesn't really affect those meditators in their visual experience of what is happening there at the center. Okay, so you can say they are, they are better able to ignore those distractors. Okay, so I will, I think I'm running out of time. We also measure how meditation influences time, but basically, um, as you can see here, I'll just quickly skip. When the task becomes difficult, uh, the again, your resolution, your temporal resolution changes, which basically shows up um, as an effect here in terms of the bisection points. I'll skip it. Okay, so one, attention, whichever way you manipulate attention in the laboratory, through cues, through scope, through whatever measures that we do, it influences subsequent visual or temporal experience. And meditative practice influences how you experience the world. This is not behavioral measures in terms of your accuracy or your reaction times, okay? We are trying to measure how you experience 
and through changes in the efficiency of how attentional processes operate. This is a quote I resonated with, so I kind of stole it from Ganeri's book, Cultivate Attention because a bhikkhu attempts knows things as they are. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Srinivasan. It was a wonderful presentation on the multiple paradigms in cognitive science and their effect on visual and temporal awareness. Thank you. I now request Venerable Geshima Tenzin Ladron. Uh, Geshima Tenzin Ladron is from Zanskar, Ladakh. She received her Buddhist education in five major Buddhist philosophical texts at Jamyang Choling Institute in Dharamshala. Currently, Geshima is serving as the Indian National Sangha Council member of the Indian Himalayan Council of Nalanda Buddhist Tradition. She is also serving as additional secretary to the board of Geshima Degree Examination Committee. Over to you, Geshima. Thank you, me. Thank you very much for having me here. And thank you for the introduction, too. And, uh, I'll just start like, uh, you know, I have a query like, do not commit any evils, practice spring virtues, and thoroughly tame your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. And another quote, uh, taming the mind is excellent. A tame mind leads to bliss. Uh, the Tibetan version is, Dipachiya Gewa Punsun Sokbache, Rangi Simdu Yongsun Dul, Dine Sangi Tembayin. Simdu Yuane Lekbate, Simdu Yuane Dewan Dens. Uh, I just mentioned this this two uh, line. Uh, as I said, is this really big statements? It's huge statement, definitely. <laughs> Where you say like, uh, do not commit any evils. Practice supreme virtues. Thoroughly tame your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. And taming the mind is excellent. It's really excellent. And a tame mind leads to bliss or happiness, you would say another way. And here you, uh, my topic is like a positive mind and mental factors in Buddhist psychology. So my understanding about Buddhist psychology or psychology in general is study of the mind. And here in Buddhism, in Buddhist literature or in Buddhist or the Buddhist teaching itself or the commentaries, written by many of the Nalanda masters. And I'm, here, I'm also here, I'm Nalanda students. I'm trying to be good Nalanda students, even though I'm not really, <laughs> still like a baby. <laughs> but yeah, you know, the study about the mind in Buddhist literature or the Buddhist teaching, it's so vast. Where it says like, commit not evils, it's not really referring to just the verbal and physical you know, evils. It's really referring to what is going inside ourselves. So, you know, all, anything that, you know, the manifest sort of uh, evil that's happening around the world now, we are really, you know, vegetarian now, we, we are aware, really aware about what is going on around the world. And then when you're looking at back in yourself in our own mind, uh, if you check from morning to evening, there's so many evils going on inside too, like <laughs> like anger, hatred, and ignorance. So because of ignorance, we do we commit evils. Because of anger and because of hatred, we you know engage in evils. So how can you really practice the opposite, in the the opposite of the evils? Which is in, a, in the religious term, it's like a virtuous, but you could say like a prior positive, positive or negative, or good or bad, another way. And what is the good thing of our mind and mental factors, and what are the bad thing or the negative thing of our mind and mental factors? So in Buddhism, in Buddhist literature or the Buddhist scripture, have mentioned so many different, like layers and numbers and numbers of what are the good. And your mind, mind and mental factors, and what are the bad or the negative mind and mental factors? And here I have like, just listed a few of them, and I I don't want you to make some positive because you know there are so many negatives going on around 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 the world. So you know who I gather here in this world, we 
how we are. I think we are trying to be positive people. We are trying to be really good people. And I really believe that we are good people in a way <laughs> because we are not really killing. And we are, I mean, of course we are. In, I, I think, I mean, personally, not really anywhere, but still we're really against violence. We are against the evils. And I just put it out like a few of the men, like a positive mental factors here in Buddhism, where you have numbers and numbers of uh, positive mental factors and minds are there. And the distinction between the mind and mental factor itself. Uh, okay, here, you know, when you talk about mind, or consciousness, or uh, another way, what? Same the yidna namshi suntunji, intuitive. Same is mind, and then mental, what? What was that one? My, same, same is mind, and yid is a conscious, no, sorry, namshi is a consciousness, another one is mental, mentalities or something like that. And we have six main mind, or we call it primary mind, and then, 51 or 52 is dependent on in which uh, like Abhidharma text you are quoting. There are six fifty-one mental factors. And out of 51, I have listed 11 virtuous mental factors. And I did that for purpose because uh, I've been I've been really fortunate to connect it with uh, all these monasteries. And this morning Yeshitapla was showing about the debate in the monasteries, like in Sarah. You know, those, you know, recently this all, I think they are like international students who are really debating. What debate, it means like it's actually, you could say it's like a analytical meditation, I guess. You know, when you're talking about meditation, you have, you could be in two, single blood meditation or analytical meditation. In the monastery and the nunneries where you do a lot of debate, where we, we do a lot of uh, debate means like discussion discussion about what is good and what is bad, and mainly about the mind and mental factors, mainly. Of course, we you know speak, I mean, debate another thing too, but the main thing is about the mind and mental factors and mind. And how can you really rid of this negative and mind and the mental factors, and how can you really increase the strength or the increase the positive one? And the 11 of them, why you listed it's like, a, uh, you know, the money of the monastery, you have uh, in monasteries and nunneries where we have in Tibetan community in exile and of course in Tibet. And those 11 monasteries, there are 11 monasteries which have special connection with the Tsongkhapa's teaching or the Nalanda, 17 Nalanda master teachings. And that's why I was just trying to make each of the 11 positive men, like a mental factors representing the 11 monasteries, Sarah, Devun, Ganden, and then and like a two tantric college. And then I guess he sold us the Dalai Lama's personal monastery, Sanamgyal monastery, and like these monastery. And then that really attached, you know, you know the nunneries are also like included in the, I mean, attached with these uh, monasteries. And so 11 of them, I could just say, uh, you know, <clears throat> throughout uh, what are the 11s are there? The first one is faith, and here faith doesn't really refer to the faith system we are talking about, the religious system. Faith means like, you know, the, out of the 11 positive, sorry, virtuous mental factors, faith means finding joy in what you are doing, or finding joy and free of affliction, or free of negative. So then, Finding joy it means it's true joy. It's not really like kind of a shallow understanding of joy. It's a true joy, what you are doing. For example, if you are enjoying meditating on, let's say, compassion or bodhicitta, you are really enjoying it. You are really getting some deep sort of satisfaction and believe in that. And like a faith, which, is, which means joy, Finding joy and free of uh, root and secondary affections. And then the second one, uh, there's also, it's mentioned in the text like, I don't know, I could, maybe, maybe I could uh, translate. You know, the faith is the gateway, entry into the positive world, you could say that. It's like, it's an entrance to all the positivities, all this entrance to the virtues. And then the second one is a sense of shame out of respect, 
which means if you engage in negative or evils, I I think and you know, if I engage in negative or you know like a bad thing, I will lose my face, right? And I will I won't get any respect from anybody. So that's the shame. Second one, which is a shame, you know, in the sense like a sense of shame out of respect. That's the second one. And how could you really, how could you make that it's uh, positive? It's a reframe to the individual who who have the sense of shame. It's a, it helps it for the individual to uh, refrain from negativities, doing, you know, like a refrain from doing negativities. So negativities could be anything. So we have to, we have to think about what are the negativities, what are the uh, positivities. So this is what, it, you know, the, the second one. And the third one is actually, uh, Another one is you could call it like embarrassment or sense of shame out of respect for others. If you engage in negativities or wrongdoing, other will laugh at you. Definitely, that you know you do that, right? And we this is just a normal thing. It's like a commonly we do that, right? So that's embarrassment, which is the third one, and then the fourth one, non-attachment, which means like a free of attachment to sexual existence or mundane concern or object free of secular existence how uh, I don't I wonder that you know a secular existence is in this here you just said very concerned very like an ordinary concern like what I'm going to eat today what should I wear not today and what kind of uh if I if I wear this one what the other people would think like this. if you think like this kind of uh, thinking and then acting according to the thinking these are mundane concerns like you don't care if as long as you are happy and you are somewhere like you are peace. You have the genuine peace in your mind. It doesn't matter. So that's one uh, another. You know, it's you know like a attachment to a secular existence means you are attaching to your body or your, you know, looking your face looking or something. If you attach too much to that, that give us misery. I think that give us like a problem. So because of this, this is the fourth one, which is a. Uh, in Tibetan, it's like a non-attachment, a free of attachment to secular existence or mundane concern. And then the fifth one, which is Shedang Mepa in Tibetan, and it's like non-aversion or non-hatred. Uh, you know, this problem that you are, we are facing in the today world, it's due to hatred, right? Distrusting each other. And then we hate each other. I mean, we are not, I guess. <laughs> but what is going on in like Ukraine or Russia at the moment? When you're looking at the uh, internet or the news, it's really, I don't know why, it's really disturbing. I mean, not really disturbing. It, we feel like a little kind of desperate. Why this thing going on? Maybe there is lacking about the education. This morning, Gisela was mentioning about it's a lack of educating the heart. I mean, everybody is competing. Like, you want me, I want to do me or mine. I want it to be the best. I want it to be the most powerful or I don't know, whatever the powerful is. You know, whether you want to be rich or powerful or whatever, we don't have much time to live. Maybe it's the longest life we have, we live, maybe no more than 100 or 110 or maybe 15. But then this thinking, it's really difficult. It's really, really difficult. Because of that, you know, this hatred because of the hatred, we're killing, and they're creating bomb and shooting each other, human shooting each other. It doesn't really make sense, right? You know, if you really look closely, it doesn't really make sense. But then, <laughs> when it, of course, it's really not that simple. Definitely, if you are in that situation, probably you won't, you won't be that simple. But if you look really, really closely, it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really make sense. But that's the one, another one was that uh, hatred non-aversion or a non-hatred. And then the sixth one is uh, non-ignorant or free of confusion. It's also, you know, because of confused, we engage in, uh, you know, like we act really bad thing. So this is not mental factor, like the positive mental uh, factor is free of confusion. Free of confusion, how can you really make free of confusion if we uh, strengthen our wisdom? probably we will be not confused that much. And then the seventh one, it's a Zundi in Tibetan, it's enthusiasm or perseverance. It, this is again, another mental factors. It's like a finding joy in positivity and finding joy in uh, 
virtues. And then the eighth one is Xinjiang pliancy, a spellness, a characterized by the quality of make our mind serviceable, means like make our mind uh, more kind of useful or workable. This is the eighth one. Oh, sorry. Okay. And then the ninth one is uh, another, this is really quite a long <laughs> word, conscientiousness, help the individual to reframe again in like in uh, negativities engaging. And it's also help reduce like a um, reframe in the negativities and engage in virtues. And the, the 10th one is economity. If we feel like we are all equal and we are all in, in the level of different, you know, field so we are equal so economy is the 10th one and then the 11th one which is uh, harmlessness or uh, like a number is harmlessness which is actually uh, in the nature of compassion a loving and a loving compassion yeah and some number misewa here uh, harmlessness refers from physical verbal and mental harmless harmful action it is the nature of compassion so here, um, I thought I'm going to mention a few things about what are the what is what is compassion and what is uh, love in Buddhist you know text. Okay, you know the last one, which is the eleven one, which is the harmlessness. Harmlessness here it means like if he, you know the this you know the mental factors. I'm sorry, mind and mental factors are like uh, mine is the main one and the mental factor they are they both are like a uh at how do you say like a <laughs> entity was same but as a little bit different and then the mental factors are in like a characteristic of the mind and mind is and you could use like a kind of a metaphor for the mind and mental factors the mind is like the king and then the mental factors are like uh, his busy minister or worker or secretary or whatever so and then love and compassion here love means uh it's a, you know without love and compassion we may be not be able to survive it's it doesn't mean something we have you don't have to talk thing uh, talk about like an advanced level of love and compassion but of course you know we really believe in this should be promote this should be you know, like uh, practice in our you know community in our life, and thank you, Kishila, for teaching <laughs> all this <laughs> Nalanda courses that you in the morning. And I see in this hall many of the familiar faces are here who are joining for the Nalanda courses and like different courses that different houses in, uh, are providing. And we can make some difference for the world. I guess I'm not really guess, but I'm confident that we can make some difference for the world. Start here in Delhi, maybe India, and then expand to a little bit further. I mean, we are already, you know, expanding in all over the world. I think there are like a four, what fifty-one countries, or more than like a sixty you know, participants who are joining for these courses. So let's make our kind of uh, pledge or our commitment or our determination that we can make some differences for the world. And I think it's time is not really. Uh, <laughs> Maybe my time is finished, right? So I want to just say, keep smile, <laughs> leave the tension, feel the joy, hold the peace, leave the pain and always be happy. So we have to try to find ourselves to be happy. So maybe you could make some influence. So my friends, our friend or family, and then, you know, expand furthermore. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Geshema for deeply elaborating on the 11 mental factors. Our next presenter is Dr. Pooja Dabral. Dr. Pooja is an assistant professor, Department of Buddhist and Tibetan Studies at Namgyal Institute of Tibetology in Sikkim. Her doctoral research topic is Nagarjuna's philosophy of emptiness. She has teaching and research experience with a range of institutions, including University of Delhi, JNU, Tibet House, she has numerous publications and has also presented papers on the themes such as emptiness. She is proficient in Tibetan and German and has taught for many years at University of Delhi. Dr. Puja, you can start. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible at the back? Thank you. So let me begin by uh, thanking most respected uh, chair, Ms. Parisha Jijina Ji, for kindly introducing me to our audience. I would also like to thank Venerable Geshela and Tibet House for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, let me also thank my previous panelists and uh, the fellow panelists for their excellent presentation and making my job easier. So I'll be taking a lot of references. So the topic for today's talk is mind in so my topic for today's talk is mind and cognition in Buddhist psychology. And before I go into the uh, the how the mind is defined, its nature, function, and classifications are being delineated and explained in many of the Buddha sutras as well as treatises, I would like to discuss the purpose of studying mind as it is so much emphasized, so well emphasized in Buddha sutras as well as the later commentaries. So this comes from uh, Dhammapad. I'm sorry for the bullets. Uh, some editing has been done. Okay, so the it comes from Dhammapad, which is the collection of Buddha sutras in words form. So it says, so in this uh, sutra, uh, in this uh, collection, we see that Buddha very clearly says what is the purpose of studying mind. So it's not just a rich intellectual exercise, but there is a purpose uh, for studying the or exploring the nature of mind. So it here it reads, mind is the chief. Mind is the chief and precedes them all. If with impure mind one acts or speaks, miseries follows like a cart following the ox. Mind is chief and precedes them all. If with pure mind one acts or speaks, happiness follows like a shadow that never leaves. So here we can clearly see that, that whatever, if so for example, here it clearly talks about what we call the mechanism of the rise and cessation of miseries. In other words, samsara that how something which is which we dislike we call miseries that come into being and also the opposite of miseries which is happiness which we all aspire for that comes into being so if we really explore we'll see that finally finally it comes from its respective causes. So if I rem uh, clearly remember from the previous panelists, uh, Professor Rana Pushrotam ji spoke about one verse from uh, Dependent Origination Sutra that how all the results are dependent on their respective causes. So likewise here, we can see that all the miseries that we dislike, such as anxiety, depression, stress, uh, uh, unhealthy competition or whatever you name, they are result of their corresponding causes. And likewise, the opposite of miseries that we all aspire for, such as peace, happiness, satisfaction, contentment, whatever you call it, that is also in turn is a, is a result of their respective causes. So here he clearly explains that the miseries that we dislike from the previous slide, if you can see, he says that the it comes into being by by it's the previous cause the immediate previous cause is the negative or contaminated physical and verbal actions and that in turn depends on the impure mind so impure mind here refers to just to make a clarification impure mind here refers to non virtuous or uh, and afflictive states of mind means the mind the state of mind which uh, give rise to suffering or the state of mind which the presence of which disturbs our mind so we call them afflictions and some people also translate it as destructive emotions and then uh, and the buddha nonetheless did not stop there he he goes on describing the that mind is the chief and precedes them all. If with a pure mind what acts or speaks, happiness follows like a shadow that never leaves. So just as the suffering is a result uh, dependent on certain causes, likewise the happiness that we all aspire for dependent on certain causes. And the causes are the uncontaminated actions, physical and verbal action, which in turn are dependent on the pure states of mind. Uh, technically, we call them virtuous mind, the minds which give rise to happiness. And then here, it was very interesting to hear Mr. Uh, Professor Ravindraji, how he explained that, you know, even the psychoanalysis, they help us to, initially, they help us to deal with the, uh, the physical, the deal with the physical actions to undermine or to calm down our mind. And then they go to the deeper level of emotions, such as destructive emotions. So that we, there we can see some parallels. And 
the extended, just an extended version of it, I'm sorry for the arrows, just an extended extended version, an elaborated version of these three steps that comes from Buddha Sutra, we can also find in a very well-known formulation by Arena Garjuna, who is a great Nalanda saint scholar, also revered at Second Buddha. So in his well-renowned text known as Mula Madhyamika Karika, uh, in English, Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way, he delineated or he explained those three points that I just read from Dhammapad in five extent five points. So here you can see the extended version due to the paucity of time. I'll not be going into the details, but here we can see, you know, as I took the reference of psychoanalysis and the other psychologies, they also, uh, you know, working on the level of the actions as well as the destructive emotions, we call it afflictions. But here something very interesting comes that all these destructive emotions also are finally rooted to the main root, which is known as self-grasping ignorance. So Buddhist treatises pay, and the psychology treatises pay a lot of attention in exploring this state of mind, which is ignorance, and a very particular ignorance, not any ignorance. So here, just to mention, uh, it's a very different area uh, for presentation, but just to mention the self grasp ignorance, uh, which lies at the core of all the destructive emotions, be it stress, anxiety, depression, whatever you call it, anger, hatred, and all the non-virtuous mental states, the opposite of which Geshe Ma just presented. All this negative emotion, they are finally, finally rooted to something called self grasp ignorance, it's a very precise ignorance which views all phenomena as objectively real. While they are dependently originated, we have this innate misconception of seeing things as objectively real. So that being the root, also being addressed as a part of the Buddhist psychology and philosophical treatises. So, but before going to the root, of course, we have to, as a professor, you know, many of the previous panelists discussed, we have to deal with the surface layers, which is working on the level of the actions, physical gross actions, as well as on the subtle emotions, and then finally going to the root. So in collaboration with the self grasp ignorance, there is one more mind, which is also addressed through analytical meditation and the single pointed meditation, which is a self-centered attitude, an attitude which, 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 uh, perceives oneself as more important than others. So Buddha Shakyamuni said that at the core of all our miseries, which we dislike, these are the two demons or demonic minds, I can say. self grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude. And before going to there, uh, of course, we have to deal with the surface layers as many of the other traditions and uh, Buddhist treatises go in detail. So, so it'll be interesting to study all these five layers, uh, but uh, I'll be skipping it today. So now this is the opposite of it. So again, in the same words, as you can, I'll just read this verse for you. It says, through seizing karma and affliction, nirvana is achieved. Karma and affliction arise from distorting perception, which these arise from elaboration of grasping a true existence. Elaboration sees through emptiness. So I think as uh, Geshe Thapkila also mentioned that finally, finally, the root is self grasping ignorance. So we have to, through studying this, the psychology, the study of mind and the study of the object, we have to deal with this self grasping ignorance. In, in other words, we have to cultivate the antidote to it. And the direct antidote to this mind is the mind, which is known as wisdom of emptiness. So once you have the wisdom of emptiness, consistent meditation on it will lead to abandoning this self grasping ignorance, which in turn will remove inappropriate attention. We are yet to study this, and uh, which in turn will eliminate afflictions and stop the physical cross actions, and finally leading to nirvana, which in simple terms means a state which we all aspire for a state of peace or happiness. Okay, so from this presentation, what you note is that. Mind being a subject, you know, we always, we are talking about mind today. So mind being a subject, it always interacts with object, right? There should be an object, which is it, which is it interacting with. And depending on what kind of object it interacts with, uh, either happiness or miseries come into being. For example, just to give you an example, if a mind misperceives or interacts with an object, not inconsistent, which is not consistent with the reality. For example, a mind which misperceives a rope as a snake, uh, it leads to bad. It leads to fearful consequences, such as you know, uh, fear. So now I come to the mind. So how mind is defined? So if mind, so. From this, we have to know that, okay, so finally, what we experience, what we want to experience is happiness and we, what we want to shun is suffering. So all these in experiences are the result of the interaction of two things, mind 
and its object, right? So we have to know this mind in its most refined form and also know the reality of the object in its most refined form. So understanding the object in its most refined form, we confine to the study of philosophy and of course physics and other subjects. And then studying this mind to its fullest form and also in most refined form, we call it psychology. So now uh, the topic for today is psychology and the mind. So now how the mind is defined in many of the Buddhist treatises and sutras. So the mind is defined, so in Buddhist treatises, mind is defined as a clear and knowing agent. So what do you mean by that? So as we can see, this definition brings forth two aspects, the aspects of clarity and the aspect of knowing or cognition. The aspect of clarity and the aspect of knowing or cognition. So what do you mean by aspect of clarity here? So clarity here has two connotations. One is clarity and other is luminosity. I'll be explaining both here. So for uh, understanding the clarity aspect of mind, oftentimes the example given is of the mirror. So just as you know, uh, for example, if the surface of the mirror is not clear, then whatever object you put in front of the mirror, the, clear, the, the reflection will not be formed. But if the surface of the mirror is clear, then whatever object you put in front of the mirror, the reflection is formed. Likewise, just is in the case of the mind, just as in the case of the mirror, likewise in the case of the mind, uh, the surf, for example, let's say I'll give you an example. Let's say when you think about a flower, a flower is reflected on your mind, right? An image of the flower comes to your mind. Why? Because this just because the surface of the mind is very clear. If the surface of the mind is not clear and tainted by some kind of stains, then this image cannot be formed on the mind. So from this, we can deduce that the surface of the mind or the nature of mind is clear. And the other connotation of this clarity is the luminosity. So to, so to explain this, for example, let's say if there is dark in this room, then although there are many objects lying there, we will not be able to see the objects. So we always need an external source of light to illuminate the objects. So likewise, when we imagine or when we think about a flower, the image of the flower comes to our mind and that image is not dark, right? So what illuminates that? So that is called the luminosity aspect of the mind. So this is known as one aspect of the mind. The nature of the mind is clear in nature. Number one. Number two is the knowing aspect of the mind. What do you mean by that? So unlike the mirror, so I just use the analogy of the mirror, that whatever you put in front of the mirror, that uh, reflects that is reflected on the surface of the mirror, provided the surface of the mirror is clear. So likewise, but unlike mirrors, so although the, let's say you put flower in front of the mirror and the, the flower is reflected on the surface of the mirror, but mirror doesn't know that the flower is reflected on the surface of the mirror. So unlike mirror, mind has this aspect of knowing its object. So not only the objects are reflected on the surface of the uh, mind because of being clear in nature, it also knows that the object is reflected on its surface. So this is known as the knowing aspect of the mind. So there you can see the uh, dissimilarity also when it comes to mirror and the mind. And there is a similarity also. So mind has two aspects. One is the clarity aspect to it and also has the knowing aspect to it, means knowing its object which are reflected on its surface. So this is how mind is defined in the Buddhist treatises. And there are many other characteristics of the mind which we can study. For example, the mind that we are talking about is a non-physical entity. It's not physical matter. So we are not talking about brain, number one. Number two, it's impermanent in nature. So it's changing momentarily. Let me make a clarification here. So while we are talking about the mind and consciousness, we are borrowing a foreign language to discuss a concept which is so richly explored in many of the ancient Indian uh, philosophical systems. So we, since we are borrowing a language, there are limitations. So here, so we have to contextualize, we have to contextualize. So here when I talk, when we use the word mind or consciousness, we are talking about the empirical mind that we all experience and not some abstract phenomena. Okay, now, so I'll be skipping this. Okay, so now, after the mind, uh, the definition of the mind, there are different ways by which the mind can be classified. And in Buddhist treatises, there are different ways of classifying the mind. And uh, just before me, Geshema uh, discussed about the mind and mental factors. You can see from the bottom second, second last one, mind and mental factor. This is one way of classifying the mind. There are many other major ways of classifying mind. I'll be just reading them and I'll try to explain the first one. The first one is sevenfold division of mind. Number two is cognitive mind and affective mind. 
Number two is sense consciousnesses and mental consciousnesses. Sense consciousness is referring to all the five senses and one mental consciousness. And then there is something also known as non-conceptual mind and conceptual mind. Then there is also a classification known as non-mistaken mind and mistaken mind. Another one is collective engager and eliminative engager awareness. And then the mind and mental factors and also subtle mind and gross mind. So there are various ways of classifying the mind. So in other words, if somebody is interested, uh, the mind is being extensively explored and discussed in Buddhist psychological treatises. Okay, so now the first one is sevenfold division of mind. This is very, this is a major way of uh, classifying the cognitive mind. So before I go to the divisions, let me just quickly explain the cognitive and the affective di distinction. What do you mean by cognitive mind? A cognitive mind is a mind which uh, apprehends its object without being uh, or discerns its object without being pulled and pushed by it. Uh, simply, for example, let's say when I see this mic. So I have a mind which knows that there is a mic, right? So this is the cognitive nature of the mind, that it knows that this is mic and this is not flower. It doesn't mean that all cognitive minds are correct mind. Within cognitive mind, we can have a dis erroneous cognitive mind. For example, if I see this mic as a flower, so this is also a cognitive mind, but erroneous in nature. So cognitive mind can be both erroneous as well as non-erroneous. And then on the basis of the cognitive minds, we have also affective mind. For example, let's say if I say, uh, let's say this pen, if I say, okay, this is pen, this is cognitive nature of the mind. And then I say, I like this pen or I don't like this pen. So not only you discern the object, you are pulled or pushed by the object. So that is the affective nature of the mind. So now this sevenfold division is a uh, one, uh, sevenfold division is a cognitive, is a division of the cognitive mind. So all the cognitive minds, uh, they are uh, classified under this self sevenfold division of minds. In other words, uh, affective minds are also there. For example, compassion, uh, bodhicitta, and then loving kindness, all other minds that uh, Geshe Ma discussed today, some of them were affective in nature. Okay, so that the first one, okay, as you can see before even I read this uh, for you, you can see there is some uh, 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 sequence or order there. You can, as, okay, let's read that together. It says direct valid perceiver, then inferential cognizer, subsequent cognizer, correctly assuming consciousness, non-discerning direct perception, doubting consciousness, and deceptive consciousness. So as we can see, even without explaining, you will be seeing some kind of uh, uh, order in terms of, uh, from the bottom, if you go higher up, you can see the mind is becoming progressively ref more and more sophisticated and more and more refined. So in other words, uh, let me explain it. So of course, you know, in Buddhist treatises, if you go to the psychology treatises, the definitions are given and their further divisions are given. I'll not be able to explain them, but today I'll just briefly explain them with the help of examples. So first is the, from the bottom, first is deceptive mind. So basically a deceptive mind is a mind whose apprehension of the object does not tally with the reality. For example, the, the slide that I shared earlier, as you can see this one, the mind whose apprehension of the object does not tally with the reality. Why? Because the object is rope and your mind sees on at the place of rope, your mind seeing a snake. So your apprehension of the object does not tally with the reality. So these are known as deceptive mind. And there can be many kinds of deceptive mind. And from the previous, previous slide, the first slide that I shared here, uh, the root cause of all our miseries, which is self raspy ignorance, is the worst of the deceptive mind that we have to uh, cure in order to reach the happiness that we all seek. So now deceptive mind uh, is the worst of the deceptive uh, deception, uh, as I said, is the self raspy ignorance. Then from deceptive minds, the second layer is the uh, doubting consciousness. Doubting consciousness, let's say I'll give you an example. For example, let's say some people, uh, they doubt that, okay, the nature, the true nature of your mind is not, uh, uh, is, is very defiled, you know. So they have this conviction that the true nature of our mind is defiled on the basis, uh, on the reasoning that uh, because most of the time or predominantly we have anger, anxiety, depression, and then they go to the extent of believing that the true nature of mind is defiled. So this is where, you know, they, so then somebody tells them that, okay, if this is so, then, you know, uh, we at times we have positive states of mind also, at times we have compassion also, at times we have joy also. So now, depending on these readings, persons start to raise a doubt, right? That, okay, 
yeah, my the nature of my mind may not be defiled. So then you have upgraded from a deceptive conscious. So earlier you thought that the true nature of our mind is deceptive and however much effort you put, you cannot really change the nature of mind and we have to suffer. Whereas this is a deceptive mind, right? Because there are positive minds and there are joyful minds also. So now when somebody gives you reasoning or you yourself explore some reasoning, you are upgrading from deceptive to the doubting consciousness that, okay, maybe the true nature of our mind is not defiled. And this doubt can be of three kinds. The doubt that is tilted towards the fact, the doubt that is tilted towards the non-fact and the doubt that is tilted towards both fact and non-fact equally. Okay, then from doubting consciousness, I'll jump to something called correctly assuming consciousness, the fourth one. So from, uh, you know, some people since beginning, they have this conviction that the true nature of our mind is not defiled. Although at times I go through suffering, I go through anxiety, depression, stress, but this is not the true nature of mind. If I put right efforts, I can change this these emotions, I can abandon or remove these destructive emotions. So although this person has a correct view or although this person has a right view, but this view is not based on a sound reasoning, but some kind of assumption. So this kind of mind that we have is known as correctly assuming consciousness. Now, when this mind gets a proper reasoning, proper reasoning and develops the conviction in this fact that the true nature of a mind is not defiled based on a sound reasoning, then this mind is upgraded from correct assumption to the inferential cognition, the second one. The second one, which means where you infer a fact on the basis of a sound reasoning. And then another, another example of such inferential cognition would be, for example, uh, we can infer the presence of fire on the basis of the presence of smoke belonging from a house. So that is the inferential cognition. So it's a correct mind. It validly cognizes something, but it is on the level of the inference. So then through uh, now, although it's inferential and validly cognizing mind, but it is not as powerful and unwavering as the first one, which is direct valid perceiver, where you cognize the object directly without having to rely on a reasoning. So now, from this, we have to see that all the analytical meditation that we are discussing, with the purpose is to go from deceptive mind to the direct valid perceiver. That, okay, for example, as we said, that the root cause of all our miseries is twofold, self-grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude. And then to undermine these two, we have to cultivate the opposite, which is wisdom of emptiness and the other cherishing mind. And the best of the other cherishing mind explained is the bodhicitta mind. So we have to cultivate these two mind. And how we start is from deceptive consciousness going up to the direct valid cognition through analytical meditation. So therefore, and then just to explain the other minds which are listed there, subsequent cognizer and the non-discerning one. So subsequent cognizer, as you can see, the first one, direct valid perceiver and the just, inferential just, cognizer. Uh, yeah. Two more minutes, please. We have yeah, just one. Thanks. So uh, first one, as you can see, direct valid perceiver and the inferential cognizer, the first moment of these two minds are known as prime cognizer, whereas the second moment and down, they are known as sec uh, subsequent cognizer. To make it very simple, for example, if I look at this mic for five moments, the first moment is known as prime cognizer, whereas the second moment and down, they are all named as subsequent cognizer. And then the fifth one, which is a little interesting, I like to give an example. Non-discerning direct perception is like, for example, even when you're listening to my talk, if you have something very important to think about, or your mind is totally engrossed in something else, or planning your evening, then you may not, although I'm standing in front of you, but you may not register my presence. So this is known as, although the person or the object appears to your mind, but you may not register the presence of it, this is known as non-discerning direct perception. So now, the to conclude, I would say that finally the purpose of all this classification and the various classification that we study is finally twofold is that that finally how well the, the degree to which you know you recognize these minds in your own mental continuum in your own mental continuum will help us to change and rectify and refine them and finally go to the level of uh, direct value perceiver which help us to get to the get to abandon self grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude along with other layers so that we fulfill our true aspiration, which is not wanting suffering and wanting happiness. So with this, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pooja, for very systematically unfolding the nature of the mind and how we can unleash the good potential of the mind while reducing our destructive emotions. Our next presenter is uh, Ms. Tenzin Bhuti, 
Ms. Tenzin is working as a campus counselor at the Dalai Lama Institute for Higher Education, Bangalore. She is a second generation Tibetan born and raised in Himachal Pradesh. She completed her master's in psychology with specialization in clinical psychology. Tenzin has interned at various pro bono mental health organizations where she has worked as a project coordinator, content creator and researcher including at Tihar Jail. Uh, Tenzin sees herself as a mental health advocate and she looks forward to spreading awareness and openly speaking about the taboos surrounding mental health and she also incorporates principles and learnings on Buddhist psychology. Yeah. So, over to you Tenzin. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, very warm good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so today I'll be speaking on the topic uh, attention and awareness from Buddhist psychology point of view and the significance of both of these concepts in the field of mental health. So I don't really have any big research to go to share the finding or also I don't have in-depth study of all this concept but whatever I'll be sharing today is just based on my learning and also my experience of working as a mental health advocate. So. <clears throat> I thought I'll break my topic into three subheadings. So first to understand awareness and attention in very general understanding and then to talk about the both concept from the field of Buddhist psychology and finally wrap it up with its significance when we talk about mental health. And before actually starting with my topic, I would just like to do a quick willing check-in. So there are a few emotions here. I was just wondering how is everyone feeling right now? How are you all feeling? Okay, thank you so much for your participation. So now I would just like to start. Now when we talk about attention in a very general way of understanding we define it as a focusing onto a particular stimuli with all our resources and we also concentrate on a particular object. So this concentration or this cognitive process can be the basis for other processes as well. For example, like decision making and emotional regulation. While when we talk about awareness, we tend to define it as how we observe our thoughts, our feelings, and also our mental state. So Awareness is not just about the journey within, but also being very mindful of the external surrounding as well. And to draw an analogy, attention, just like one of the speaker has mentioned, attention is more of being in the spotlight where you're focusing on just one stimuli out of all the rest. While when we talk about awareness, we, we know that what is happening behind or like at the background, but it's just that we are focusing on to a particular thing. Okay, so when we understand attention from the Buddhist psychology point of view, it is translated as Gila Chepa. So it is one of the five, one of the 51 mental factors and out of which there are five omnipresent factors. So there are like five factors that always goes together and attention is one out of it. The nature of attention is basically bringing our mind to action or basically directing our mind to focus onto an object without like jumping our attention onto other things. So we are just focusing onto an object and then moving deeper onto it. So, so now to talk about awareness, in Buddhist texts, we don't really talk about awareness as such, but it is understood through the opposite. So lack of awareness, which is called Sheshin Mahimpa. So uh, this is also one of the 51 mental factors and it is the 19th one out of 70 secondary afflictive mental factors. So awareness basically der derived from ignorance. So when we are not able to discern the reality as it is, then we become like, then it results in lack of awareness. So we are not able to like filter out the relevant and irrelevant thought or logical ones with the illogical one. So uh, both the concept of attention and awareness is very much used when we do single-minded meditation where when we focus on a particular object we are using attention but then when we realize that during the process our mind is jumping onto other things then we 
make use of our awareness to bring it back to the focus. So this is how we can try to understand it. And also to draw an analogy. So awareness is more like knowing, which is the sky. But in the sky, there are clouds. So these are all the thoughts, emotions, and feeling, which sometimes comes to our registration. But then there are times when we don't even like acknowledge these feelings and thoughts. Okay, so now when we say lack of awareness, it is basically an awareness which results in carelessness, indifference, and also moral failing. So because of this lack of awareness, it tend to result in, you know, deeming all these minor issues into major ones. So seeing a very small suffering as a big thing and exaggerating it. So that's like uh, a diluting, discriminating awareness. So because of this lack of awareness, it results in doing some improper verbal behavior or like physical activities. Okay, so to link uh, awareness with mental health, I thought self-awareness is something that really start off with. So self-awareness is as simple as knowing how, knowing our emotion, our feelings and bodily changes when in a particular situation. So see, we are in this conference room. So just registering to our mind, okay, what am I feeling right now? So what are the like bodily sensation I'm getting? So actually acknowledging it, because what happens is like, we are so busy and we are always chasing something or the other that we don't get time to register or be receptive of our emotions and feeling. So if we are really aware of all these things, it helps us to touch upon the internal world that is often left undetected. So the Johari window exercise, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So this is something that I use with a student where it allows them to discover the hidden facets of them or certain things that they are blind to so what happens is like when they re really understand or when they realize that okay this is within me then it starts to like help them to acknowledge their current standing so then they started appreciating themselves right so by taking this step forward we then look forward for the changes or the growth that we want to see so this is about self-awareness and also emotional awareness is something that is often talked about in recent days where we try to understand our emotion and acknowledge it other than just repressing or piling it up so in most of the mental illnesses maybe like depression anxiety or stress what happens is like we we fail to acknowledge the emotion at the moment and then we started piling it up and once it blasted off, it really resulted in some drastic consequences. So emotional awareness is all about focusing on, on our internal dialogue. And with this understanding, we then start to like start our healing journey, I would say. So, so a study conducted by Harvard Brain Science Initiative has found out that children and adolescents who has really low emotional awareness, when they grow up, they have like higher severity or greater severity of getting mental illness so this speaks volume about how important it is for us to like acknowledge our emotion than being very judgmental about it because we so we are so raised and we are so like we grow up acknowledging the positive emotion but then when it comes to negative emotion and experiences we tend to like brush it under the rug and often not talk about it so this is about emotional awareness where we acknowledge the emotion without any judgment and without any filter all right so uh to link awareness with mental health i i believe and i also saw it very like in general that people often tend to link mental health with mental illness while both the concepts are very different when we talk about mental health we are not talking about depression we are not talking about the ocd and all these mental illnesses we are talking more about realizing one's own potential and then making contribution to the community so the world health organization has defined mental health as when an individual is able to cope up with their stressors make some contribution to their community so that's when we say we are, have a sound mental health so in order to like reach to that positive mental health or to like uh, reach this journey i believe self-awareness and emotional awareness is the first step to this process and mental health also is about discovering one's true self so in therapy we often use person centered therapy or gasol therapy where the focus is majorly on letting the people understand their feelings and be aware of who they are so that they get more freedom and this also helps them to solve the problem much earlier than to like leave it at the like last minute 
So when we talk about awareness, we talk it on two levels. So the ordinary awareness is basically understanding our thoughts and feelings and living it as it is. But okay, so saying like, okay, I'm angry, I'm feeling something. So these are the example. But now when we take this anger to the next level by diving deeper into it, understanding the trigger, what is causing that anger or what are the consequences. So this is when we talk about meditative awareness. So that is, I would say that is more like analytical meditation where we are contemplating on the emotion and then like taking it to the next level. Okay, so with this awareness, what really helps us is to like distinguish between the relevant thoughts and disruptive thoughts and also the intrusive ones. So with this awareness, it also, like mentioned, helps us to recognize the problem much earlier. And the significance of both the concepts in mental health is first the awareness, it really helps us to know or recognize the fundamental nature within ourselves. So for example, understanding what thoughts are here with you or what are the feelings that is present at the moment. So these are the things that help us to broaden our awareness about oneself. And then when we talk about attention, we are not just talking about focusing on a stimuli, but also being very receptive of all the emotion and also being in the capacity to be in the moment. So this is more about mindfulness and also like communicating one's own emotion without having to like repress it. And this is one verse that I found from A Guide to Bodhisattva's Way of Living. So the chapter five is all about guiding our introspection or alertness. So the verse two says all about the lack of awareness. So it says, letting the elephant of my mind run wild will cause the misery of the hell. In this world, even the untamed and crazed elephants do not cause misery equal to that. So it tries to do analogy with a crazy elephant which can cause like really serious consequences but it says if you're not aware of what is happening with us the consequences caused by this uh like lack of awareness is more severe than a crazy elephant damages so this is the level at which lack of awareness can take a toll on oneself and then like to talk in very very general way so the lack of awareness it results in us to follow the habitual pattern of living in the past. So what really happens is like when we are not like aware of our emotion, we either live in the past tragedy or we anticipate threat in the future. So in this process, we tend to lose the present momentum. We are not able to like acknowledge our present like moment. So this is the this is the main like focus of mindfulness practices where we are bringing all our sensory experiences to let us be in the moment. Uh, so the most important thing is to incorporating awareness in our daily life. So now we have seen how the lack of awareness can take a toll on oneself and then what happens when we are truly aware of ourselves. So how can we actually put this into practice in our daily life is more important. So first thing is thought journaling. So I believe this concept is very familiar to all of you. So basically doing like a brain dump like we do. So when we are experiencing all the emotional apps and flow to simply let it out by journaling. So by journaling I don't really mean using like a word to express your thoughts, but also simply incorporating incorporating art as well. So this is how we try to like let ourselves vent out and then prepare for the next rather than just piling up and then feeling check in just like we did. So having like a five minutes time out of your daily schedule to simply or quickly check in with your feelings and emotion. And then mindfulness based meditation is how we incorporate our sensory experiences and perception to be aware of our internal world or internal body. And finally, grounding technique, which is often used for anxiety and all, where we are trying to like, uh, rather than tangling too much into the past or like thinking too much into future, but just being in the moment or living in the moment. So these are the things that I don't, I won't say like the effect is very immediate, but then when I, tell students with like students who are having mild anxiety and all doing something like journaling and all the effect of it truly reflects throughout the process so it's not really immediate so what's the point of writing your emotion down in a book just for a day but what happens is like we are simply not allowing us to like pile the emotion but then just rent it out or puke whatever is in your mind so this is how we incorporate awareness in our day-to-day -day practices
And finally, I would just like to wrap it up by sharing the next verse from the same chapter, same book. So this is all about the effect of mindfulness meditation. But if the elephant of mind is firmly bound by the rope of mindfulness, all fears will cease to exist and the old virtues will come into my hand. So with this, I would just like to wrap up my presentation here. And I would really like to thank Gishela for offering me this opportunity. I once used to sit there occupying that seat during my college. And now today to share this seat with the panel, like it's so weird. But then to reach this process is all because of you, Gishela. And for that, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude and also the entire team of Tibet House for letting me feel Delhi like a home, even though it's just for a day. And finally, uh, Dr. Kauri Gilla, who is not present here today, but she's the one who offered me the opportunity. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, Tenzin, for sharing with us very simple techniques which we can use for our well-being and also forging out the role of awareness in mental health. So we had a very rich panel and I now open the four questions. Yes. Yes, sir. No. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is to, uh, to Dr. Uh, Shiranivasan. Uh, when you are measuring the attention, based on the meditation practice uh is it just the span of the time or the quality of the attention also or what i'm trying to understand is that what are the uh, uh factors which you put into in that measurement thank you so um at least in the presentation today I don't know whether you noticed, attention was actually not directly measured. It was manipulated. And what was measured is some aspect of perception. Okay, so that's the way uh, today's talk was uh, done. But in terms of measuring attention directly, uh, there is one slide, if you remember, you can measure it. Obviously, you have to measure it indirectly. Uh, so one way you can measure it is using speed response time. Uh, the other is something you already mentioned. Sometimes we try to measure what sometimes people call attention span. Um, that is another thing that we can measure. So um, that, then there is a third way to measure, which is more difficult. But in terms of breaking attention further into further more component mechanisms, and those can be measured. That's also something we do. So for example, if you think of attention like a filter, then I can try to measure how efficient the filter is. Right? Filter out information. Yes, you had a question. Yeah. It was very beautiful to hear from all the lovely ladies. Really so inspiring. My question is to uh, all all three ladies. So Tenzin, you uh, spoke very beautifully about not uh, removing past tragedy and f thinking of future threat. So say for instance, like I'll share my personal example. So over the years of my life, in the especially three to four years, I have had the bad fortune of meeting really dishonest chartered accountants. And it's repeating. So now even though if I have to interview another uh, chartered accountant, I, my mind and my whole system takes me to the past experiences. So how can I totally eradicate that and, you know, be more positive about such instances, such people through my mind, of course. Like, I, I see it as a future threat, you know, that this, they, what if this one is also bad? So I don't really have a concrete answer for your experience, but what I can say is like, I mean, the experience can be real, but but this having had such experience does not really like close your door for the upcoming ones. And then the fact that 
like when you say you had like experience so can you can we really like quantify how like how many is it like just like i said when we i don't know like when we are not really aware we tend to like exaggerate it so i won't say like the experiences that you had will completely shun the coming ones but then like taking i don't know like taking that as a lesson and then be a little mindful for the next but also not making sure that this is going to happen forever because i won't i i mean i cannot really say but then it won't be like that big to close the door for the next one as well i hope i have answered your question to some extent sorry i didn't get your name so uh, as tensila already said i don't have a concrete answer for it but i would say there is no need to forget this experience in fact this is really good if you see the positive side of this experience because sometimes we tend to exaggerate during interviews right but if you had one experience earlier if you use it positively positively to not to exaggerate the qualities on the basis of just seeing the qualification there and the what the person speaks during the interview then it will be in a way it's a positive factor for you to analyze the person better so if you take it positively i would say no need to forget it use it for better judgment and also of course be mindful that uh, as you are already mindful i'm glad that it might affect my you know interviewing so then you have to try to be a little objective also depending on the the qualification the experiences person said and the later later performance but uh, i think no need to forget it but you can use it positively yes doctor Uh, Mrs. Tenson Butri, uh, you made a very insightful uh, remark, uh, which I also share because I work with children, but in a neurodevelopmental pediatric sense. Uh, you said, uh, and I agree, uh, that if children have been used to sort of uh, subjugating their emotions and not being allowed to freely express them for whatever reason uh when they grow older they uh, have some very bad consequences and these consequences as you said uh can manifest as anxiety depression and uh, pretty serious things um can you elaborate a little more if you've had more than one or two experiences so for letting our emotions out for the child just like you have mentioned the consequences so it's not just with the illnesses but also certain like addiction or like impulsive behavior can be the cause of not letting the emotion out during the childhood but to incorporate how to like express the emotion when their child is just like mentioned the feelings check in which i found really useful even in my interaction with students because many other times they don't really get the time to sit with the emotion and then let it out so maybe like incorporating it in their daily life to for example like starting off the day with some kind of like prompt say like how are you feeling or things that you are grateful for today so as simple as this thing can really help them to like let the emotion of one day be that and then not take it forward so <clears throat> more complex than that uh once the damage has occurred uh -huh. and that child is now an adult uh -huh. and that adult has now formed this habit of you know i don't want to talk about it uh pushing everything under the carpet now uh -huh. how to bring that adult to understand that this is a throwback and it was not the child's fault Mm -hmm. the child was with uh, a, an american family um uh, as a what are they called um instead of going to boarding school with a family and it was an american pediatrician uh, so you would think it would be quite a liberal family but clearly it was not and the child was not allowed to express his feelings and now it has grown into a very vicious circle and at this adult level how uh, can we make and it's very intense very intense can you hear me yeah yeah i can uh, how can uh, this adult now uh, use his awareness and his great intelligence uh, to come out of it tensing would you like me to help you 
Uh, yes, so doctor, basically what we do in this case is if what I have understood is if you have childhood trauma and that translates into adulthood. Yes, so here the first step would be for the person, for the adult to become aware of his patterns, to become aware of the conditioning in childhood which has led to his current behavior and uh, Professor Srinivasan can elaborate. There's something called as neuroplasticity. So the patterns what we have learned as children can be unlearned as an adult. Professor, would you like to elaborate? <laughs> well, uh, very far from my expertise. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't work with uh, patients or um, those yeah, I guess ultimately you have to unlearn uh, certain things. Uh, I mean, these days people have tried various intervention methods. Uh, I can't really say how effective they are in terms of uh, taking care of the situation you just mentioned. Uh, but I guess if it's possible to teach attention training, mindfulness, these are things that could be tried. I know people have... Uh, have been running clinical trials on various neurodevelopmental disorders and things like that uh, with some yeah. you know, efficacy. So, correct. So basically so, we have a line in psychology that whatever has been learnt can be unlearnt as well. right? And you could also explore a, a very good theory called growth mindset which talks about uh, how you can grow. I mean, if, if you want to explore, there's a good theory by Carol Dweck called growth mindset. So that can also help in this situation. Carol Dweck, growth mindset. D-W-E-C-K. D-D, Carol Dweck. Yes, D-W-E-C-K. Yeah. Uh, so, please catch up. Okay, so basically, uh, these two questions. The first question, the about the childhood accountant, and the the trauma a child faced during childhood translated into when the child grew, becomes adult. So how do you get away from this? At the unlearn, I'm not too sure about this, but what I would say is that the uh, but this is something so important, be it the counselors or the pediatricians, or anybody. It's so important to have a vast learning. And for that matter, it is not necessary that you should be expert in every phenomenon, every discipline, but the um, but you have to, there's always a possibility for you to look for somebody else who, who has uh, the more greater exposure to the particular situation. To give a very simple example is that if there's a person uh, who whose earning is only like 5,000 rupees per month. But that person, if somebody cheats him or her uh, the and making her lose like eight, eight make them lose 4,000 rupees is a huge amount for that person. It's a huge amount. If you teach the person how to, how to, how to get two lakhs per month, then the 4,000 is just nothing. So this is how the psychology works. If you can teach the person, the child with the trauma, with a particular situation, the situation X, and the child can see, child will see this X in the whole world of trauma. But then the, if the child learns that there are so many positive things, and this is just one part of small thing, then the, in the face of this enormous, the hundred times the X amount of the positivities, and then versus the just one X amount of the negativity, one amount is nothing. So why should I be? Why should I feel so demoralized? It's so small. It's so insignificant. But if you just see, have only two Xs, one is the X amount of the the trauma, and another X amount of joy or half X amount of joy, and X amount of the trauma that outshines. The other, so therefore he, he or she feels so demoralized that the, it may go to the extent of the, the person not wanting to even talk about it as you grow older. Whereas if you want, once you see that this is so insignificant in the, the face of so many good qualities that I can learn. So it's so insignificant. Then you can see that just like a very faint memory of the past, something of a joke, not a serious matter. So therefore, this is where the vast learning the Buddha emphasized so much on the learning, vast learning. Even if you have the, if you don't have the 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 knowledge, 
knowledge, even if a bright mind, intelligent, even if you're intelligent, but if you don't have the vast learning, then you cannot see the whole world of the beauty. So the, it's so important that to tell the, the child that this is not everything. This is a small part of the, the reality. So the, the world is so beautiful. It's huge, massive. What you're going through is just tiny. Don't, don't say, in fact, for the individual, for the individual, for whatever happened to the individual, seeing that as the factor to bow you down, that's the greatest failure. Nobody else can fail the person. Nobody else can, even if somebody can put you to so much of 100 times the trauma, even you cannot be, be failed. As long as you have the smartness to see the whole world much, much, much bigger than what happened. So this, seeing the world in relative terms, that's so important. And the, uh, the, even be a counselor, be a counselor, or anyone, we all have to always learn from when you encounter with somebody else, and then you, you know, you may not be able to deal with the situation well. Always keep in mind that there must be somebody else who can address these problems. So you should be able to maintain an openness to learn from somebody else, not that you know, oh, I have to do this my job. I can do this, and you feel to, and the counselor needs another counselor. Thank you. Thank you, Geshila. Thank you. We'll conclude today's panel. Uh, thank you, and we are sorry that we could not be able to take any more questions due to the time limitation. And we also have uh, different conferences coming by, so please come and join and take the opportunity to raise many different questions. Yeah, and thank you very much, Dr. Parisha Ji, for chairing this session, and to all the speakers here and as well in the floor for sharing the thought-provoking knowledge and amalgamating three different aspects in single frame on this conference for the well-being of humankind, as Professor Ravindra Nagendra has said this morning. And now may, may I request Professor Renuka Singh Ji, a retired professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi and the director of Tushita Mahayana Meditation Center, New Delhi, to kindly do the honor of offering the sovena and the kata to our chief person and the speakers, please. Dr. Parisha Jijinaji, our chairperson of this session. Dr. Narayan Srinivasanam Ji. Venerable Geshe Martins and Hadula. Uh, Dr. Pooja Dabralji. <clears throat> Ms. Tenzin Bhutila, the youngest speaker for the session. Tenzin is the youngest speaker, so let's give her a huge round of applause. Thank you, Professor Renugaji.